The LA Times would describe Sugar Ray as, and I quote, the unthinking man's rock band. Sugar Ray could have easily dissolved before anybody heard of them, and despite being labeled as a one-hit wonder, they were much more than that, having three successful albums and about half a dozen or so hit singles. Today, let's take a look at the history of Sugar Ray. The story of Sugar Ray begins with vocalist Mark McGrath. He would be born in 1968 to an Irish Catholic family in Hartford, Connecticut. It was at the age of five he began singing in front of his mother's mirror while playing air guitar to the Knacks My Sharona. He would tell Spin Magazine, I always wanted to be in a band and I always wanted to f around and I always wanted all the fringe benefits. But by his own admission in the same interview, he had no musical talent, but he did have one thing, a ton of charisma. It was at the age of eight in 1976, his parents moved the family across the country to California, but McGrath was less than enthusiastic about it, revealing to Spin, I knew when we came out to California that my parents would get divorced. All I ever heard about Los Angeles was that everyone gets divorced. It tortured me every day. Then of course, five years after we moved, they got divorced. I remember hiding it from everybody. It resulted in McGrath becoming more guarded and insular, and school didn't get any easier as he wasn't really a popular kid having zits and trying to find his identity. At one point he even pretended to be a goth who was into groups like the cult, but at the same time he was secretly listening to more poppy acts like Duran Duran. Despite dealing with the shock of his parents' divorce, he was mostly a good kid in high school, not really drinking or engaging in drug use, instead flirting with breakdancing and eventually becoming a pretty good basketball player. But soon enough, it would be music that changed his life. An avid reader of music magazines like Cream, Rolling Stone, and Melody Maker, McGrath's head soon became full of rock trivia, so it was no surprise in 1998 when he was a celebrity guest contestant on the TV game show Rock and Roll Jeopardy and squared off against the member of the Whack Pack Hank on the Howard Stern Show and Rock and Roll Trivia. It would be the Sex Pistols and Black Flag who would prove to be McGrath's biggest influences. Elsewhere in Newport Beach, guitarist Ronnie Shepard would meet drummer Stan Frazier at an amusement park. They were both students at Corona Del Mar High School, and both guys were mod revivalists with Shepard telling Spin, I saw these guys wearing jam buttons, and I'm like, oh my god, you're mods too. Both would come from musical families, and Shepard's family hailed from Trinidad. The pair soon started a covers band that played British music, including groups like The Jam, Small Faces, and The Who, using the moniker The Tories, which was named after the English Conservative Party who was in power at the time. While the band's popularity didn't extend far outside of the garages and house parties of Newport Beach, they did find a fan in a young Mark McGrath. In Newport Beach, it was common for parents to go away for the weekends, leaving their kids at home, who would have parties, and it was at one of these parties McGrath met the members of the Tories, revealing in the book Sugar Ray, I'd follow them around like heroes, like, hey Rod, can I carry your guitar? One night they were playing a party, I had my rack cutoff shirt on, flexing my muscles, and they called me up on stage, I screamed and did a flip into the pool, and it would be that night when McGrath performed a cover of the ACDC track Back in Black, and soon enough, McGrath joined forces with the musicians, and it was around 1987, 1988, they formed the band Shrinky Dinks. There would be a special emphasis on the X with an umlaut, since Motley Crue was really big at the time, and the members were also fans of other popular groups, including LA Guns, Faster Pussycat, and Bang Tango. By McGrath's own admission, the musicians and Trinky Dinks knew they weren't very good at writing their own material. He would reveal on the Tune on Toast podcast with Stryker that the group did write a few songs like Lick Me and Gold Digger, which were originals, but for the most part, their concerts consisted of covers. And those covers included groups like the Sex Pistols, Loverboy, The Cult, Judas Priest, Blondie, Motorhead, and Run DMC. Soon enough, Shrinky Dinks became the go-to band for any college frat party in places like Newport Beach, Santa Barbara, and San Diego. The band soon became synonymous with frontman Mark McGrath's stage antics, drawing comparisons to Iggy Pop. It wasn't uncommon for McGrath during Shrinky Dink live shows to hurl full cans of beer into the audience or wield a hockey stick on stage like an axe, as well as climb walls of the venue and hang from the rafters. His bad behavior soon earned him death threats with McGrath telling the LA Times that he did those antics to deal with his insecurity about his voice, revealing, I used to scream and yell any kind of antics to get away from my voice. But stage antics and cover tunes weren't really going to help the band make a career in music, and they knew they had to write their own original material, 
and it would be a song called Caboose that changed their fortunes. While Shrinky Dinks did not have an exhaustive list of original songs, they did have a great stage presence. It would be McGrath's best friend of nearly four decades, a guy named McGee, who would go on to have a hugely successful career in the entertainment business, who would help the band get their big break. By the early 90s, McG was still making a name for himself, and he offered to do a video shoot for the Shrinky Dink song Caboose. Rather than copying a lot of other bands at the time who were sending every record label and telephone book a demo tape of three to four songs, the band got creative. They took the video they shot for Caboose and put it in a pizza box and sent it out to MTV, management companies, and record labels. Soon enough, Rick Rubin's team and his Deaf American label called, and while the band initially thought they'd get an offer to sign with the label, they didn't. Instead, Rubin's team thought that the band's marketing was great and asked them if they wanted to be part of Deaf American Street Team to promote its roster of artists. Obviously, they said no to the offer. Shrinky Dinks would get a call from two guys from a management company, one of which was named Chip Quigley, who go on to be the band's longtime manager. Chip loved the band's video and played it for Atlantic Records president Doug Morris in late 1993, who wanted to sign the band. Keep in mind, it was two weeks between the time the Shrinky Dinks sent out the pizza boxes with the tapes in them and the time they actually reached Atlantic Records. McGrath would reveal on the band's website, we totally lied to Atlantic, we told them we had a big following from San Diego to Los Angeles, there was no social media or way for them to check though. We told them that we had a hundred songs and we only had two. Caboose ended up on our first album and the other one, Lick Me, didn't for obvious reasons. Shrinky Dinks managed to sign a one million dollar two album deal with Atlantic Records based solely on the video for Caboose. It was shortly after they signed with Atlantic that the band was threatened with legal action by toy maker Milton Bradley over infringing on the name of their Shrinky Dinks toys. The band soon changed their name to Sugar Ray, and Sugar Ray's first album, 1995's Lemonade and Brownies, would be an ode to what the band referred to as their Animal House period. The album would see the group relocate from Newport Beach to Los Angeles since it was cheaper, and the influences found on the record ran the gamut from R&B to punk to metal and funk. But the critics were pretty brutal towards the band. A 1995 review from the LA Times would have the headline, Witless Juvenilia with a Beat, and it would go on to read, These Huntington Beach-based exponents of boneheaded neo-frat rock may be bankrupt of ideas and good taste, but their ear for the ripped-off musical hook and their sharp way of pounding home variations on well-tested rap metal formulas could earn them a bundle. With the album's cheesecake artwork and infantile toilet humor title, it's clear that Sugar Ray is factoring its appeal down to the lowest denominators with this debut CD. Despite not having any radio or MTV hits in America, Sugar Ray had two things that worked in their favor. They found popularity overseas in Europe, with McGrath crediting the popularity of Rage Against the Machine as helping. The group's debut album was also enough of a success overseas that Atlantic Records kept giving the band money to do seven or so tours of Europe, and they would tour alongside Deftones and Monster Magnet. Back in America, meanwhile, Sugar Ray only did one tour opening for Korn and Lords of Brooklyn. Due to McGrath and company having heavy material in their sets, they were reasonably well received. Sugar Ray soon got some airplay in San Francisco and Seattle on their local radio stations, but that quickly fell through. The band's label even tried to do something a little unorthodox to promote Lemonade and Brownies, According to Billboard magazine, they held a streaking contest. Sugar Ray asked fans to videotape themselves streaking while holding the group's album. The videos would be judged by the label and the band themselves, with the winner getting frontman Mark McGrath's 1968 Cadillac DeVille, which would prove to be the inspiration for the album's first single, Mean Machine. Five of the runner-ups, meanwhile, would get to have dinner with Sugar Ray and get a signed copy of their debut record. To get the word out, the band's label distributed flyers about the contest to mom and pop record stores, as well as the band's concerts and on metal radio. Unfortunately, all the promotion in the world didn't help the album succeed, but McGrath would tell Billboard it was a good album that no one heard. With the group's first album proving to be disappointing commercially, Atlantic Records floated the proposition of just buying the band out of their contract. Sugar Ray still had two shows left as part of their American tour, and it would be one of Mark McGrath's friends who worked in Atlantic Records metal department who made a suggestion that would be hugely influential on their career. McGrath's friends suggested that Sugar Ray do a cover of Howard Stern's childhood band electric comic book song, Psychedelic Bee. The Meat Puppets were originally supposed to do the cover, but for whatever reason they couldn't do it, opening up an opportunity for Sugar Ray to step in. 
They would end up recording a cover, and Howard Stern loved the cover so much, he continued to play it on his radio show. Atlantic Records was so enthusiastic about the publicity, they flew the band out to New York City and put them up in hotels to appear on Stern's radio show to perform the song live. Years later, Mark McGrath would credit Stern with saving the band's career, and to pay homage to Stern, they would include the cover of Psychedelic Bee on their Greatest Hits album. The momentum from their appearance on Howard Stern led the group's label to allow them to record a second record. Unlike the first album which was recorded in California, Sugar Ray recorded their second record in New York City for a few reasons. They wanted to get away from the distractions of home, and they wanted to be closer to their label. Sugar Ray would bring in famed producer David Kahn to work on their second album titled Floored. Kahn had just finished working with Sublime, who had released their massive self-titled album. By 1996, Sugar Ray didn't really have many flushed out songs, but they had bits and pieces of songs and ideas that Khan would be instrumental in helping finish. According to McGrath, who told the Tuna on Toast podcast, Khan was pretty no-nonsense in the studio and was blunt at one point telling the frontman that he couldn't sing, but assured him that if he listened to the veteran producer, they would have a hit radio single. One of the songs born during their sessions with Khan would be the track Fly, with the Baltimore Sun describing how it came together writing, Cargus started noodling a two chord figure on his bass and Bullock fell in and scratched out a beat on his turntable. Shepard entered with an airy descending guitar hook, Frazier got up from his drum kit, grabbed a microphone and started singing what he felt which was a need to escape the band's dismal condition at that moment. However, Fly wasn't an easy sell to frontman Mark McGrath, who upon listening to the track, hated the song so much, he threatened to quit the group. McGrath felt the band should be focusing on heavier material, but it would be his close friend Mick G who talked some sense into him recalling to the LA Times. Mick G has been very involved from day one as the psychologist, therapist, and musical collaborator. He said, what else are you gonna do, work at Del Taco? Also a big fan of the song was producer David Kahn, and that was enough of a pep talk to get McGrath to give the song a shot. Fly would officially become the hit song of the summer in 1997, and while the song gave Sugar Ray their breakout hit, it was an anomaly on their second album, which featured a wide array of hip-hop, ska, pop, heavy metal, and punk. At the end of the day, Floored would end up selling about 2 million copies going double platinum, and despite the band's newfound success, critics wrote them off as the new breed of one-hit wonders. The LA Times was particularly savage writing in 1997, Instant Karma was gonna get Sugar Ray and no rock band deserved it more. Spin Magazine, meanwhile, would refer to the band as Orange County's least likely to succeed. On top of that, some fans of the single Fly were disappointed with what they heard upon purchasing the group's second album, thinking the other songs would be in line with Fly, but they weren't. But Sugar Ray answered back against critics, with drummer Stan Frazier telling the Morning Call newspaper, being diverse is not such a good idea in the music industry. Everybody is used to hearing a band, and they do just one type of song. We couldn't do that here. Everybody in this band contributes, and everybody has their own taste so of course you're going to end up with all sorts of songs so it's not surprising that we only had one fly why would we write the same song twice we're not out to be famous we just want to make cool songs aware of the critics waiting for them to fade away sugar ray returned in 1999 with their third album sarcastically titled 1459 a reference to their 15 minutes of fame almost being up but sugar ray were in on the joke they would admit that they didn't think their fame would last with shepherd telling the morning call newspaper even though we'd been in a band already for eight or nine years we got thrown in the limelight so quickly suddenly the whole world knew us for that one song and it wasn't necessarily typical of what we were doing who knew that song or any song on the album was going to take off he would add, believe me, we appreciate our success. It wasn't that long ago all of us were working day jobs. Just like the group's previous effort, 1459 would spawn a massive hit with the lead single, Every Morning, that would peak at number three on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. And several months before Sugar Ray's third album dropped, McGrath would tell the Tuna on Toast podcast that Hits Magazine would publish a story in November of 98 that wrote about the band's new single at the time, Every Morning. It looks like we've heard our first hit song of 1999, and it's from a band we never thought we hear from again, Sugar Ray. The band followed that up with the second single, Someday, which also had some success peaking at number 7 on the charts. As for the record, 1459, it would contain elements of the group's past records while also being more commercially accessible, and it would perform better than their previous outings, selling 4 million copies. The band would be scheduled to play Woodstock 99, but had to bow out due to an unspecified illness that Mark McGrath was dealing with at the time. Despite the band's repeated success, they were still subject to ribbing in the press, 
The LA Times published an article in January of 1999 titled, Sugar Ray Two Hit Wonders, but the criticism from the press did little to phase the members with guitarist Rodney Shepard responding back telling the Baltimore Sun, we've never taken our music totally seriously. We have more of the old attitude of rock and roll, forget about your troubles and have a good time. With Bullock adding about the success of the group's single Fly, everything changed after that. We started to understand our potential as a band, creatively and commercially. As for the lyrical theme, Shepard credited the shift in the band's sound to getting more mature, adding, we went into this album going, hey, we're all in our 30s now, we want to get a little more musical here. Sugar Ray would return in 2001 with their fourth record, which was self-titled, and the band would enlist Linkin Park and lit producer Don Gilmore. Sugar Ray had in his pocket what they thought could be a hit song with the track When It's Over. The only problem was that McGrath thought the version they cut with Don Gilmore was missing something. So he called up their old producer pal David Kahn to lend a hand to the song. Their instinct would prove to be correct as the song would prove to be another hit for the band, but the album would sell fewer copies than its predecessor and Sugar Ray's stars seemed to be fading and they weren't getting as much attention on rock stations across America as the new generation of rock bands who were coming up at the time like The Strokes and The White Stripes. The band's follow-up record 2003's In the Pursuit of Leisure was the final nail in the coffin for the time being. File sharing was becoming more and more prevalent, and while it likely impacted the group's previous record sales, In the Pursuit of Leisure was a commercial flop. McGrath would reveal on the Tuna on Toast podcast that by 2003, there was a sense of dread at the record labels that the sky was falling. McGrath would add, In the Pursuit of Leisure was a band at the end of their rope with no creative juices left, nothing. Even before its release, McGrath would admit on the Tuna on Toast podcast that he knew that the band was commercially done. The record sold a measly 135,000 copies, far short of even going gold. Sugar Ray would hit the road to support the album alongside Matchbox 20 in the summer of 2003. McGrath would tell Rolling Stone what was happening around this time, saying, In 2003, the writing was on the wall for bands like Smash Mouth, Third Eye Blind, Everclear, Bare Naked Ladies, bands in our fraternal mid-90s modern rock universe. Radio was changing. In 2003, we hired the Neptunes to be a little R&B and funk, and that really didn't work for us. We sold 135,000 copies coming off a platinum selling record in 2001. We thought maybe we should stop and smell the flowers and see what else is out there for us. I'm dumb enough to host these music and award shows, and some chick at Extra saw it and said, you kind of suck at hosting, but there's something there. Two weeks later, I'm hosting Extra. The other guys had new little babies and stuff. It was actually a good time to do it. So while many people thought the band broke up around this time, they didn't. They just took some time off, and Sugar Ray would reconvene every year for a few corporate gigs, some state fairs, and the odd movie soundtrack. As McGrath was about to wrap up his time at the TV show Extra, he would work with the group's longtime manager to resurrect the band and release a new album and tour. The group would sign a deal with a label named Fontana in partnership with Pulse and Universal. The new album would feature a guest appearance by Rivers Cuomo of Weezer, and their manager Chip Quigley would tell Reuters in 2009, We were part of a business where if you had a hit single, you sold 3 million records. But it's different now. The real core of our business is the live arena, and for that you need songs on the radio. So we're really going to try and get the song on radio and go out there touring the summer and show folks we're still a great live band. The group's comeback album, not to be confused for a Steel Panther record, would be called Music for Cougars, with the title coming from a friend of McGrath who told the band that all their fans were now Cougars. But by 2011, the band lost a few members with McGrath telling Rolling Stone, listen, in 2011, we didn't have the highest grossing year for Sugar Ray. One guy quit the band because he didn't want to tour anymore. I understand that. The other guy took a job with Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback who started a Christian rock label. We had a great run for 24 years. If it's not for you, then God bless you. They had our blessing. But when it started interrupting our business, that's when the blessing stopped. I can't see myself ever being on stage with those guys again. It was the same year that McGrath teamed up with Art Alexis of Everclear to start a nostalgia tour named the Summerland Tour which featured acts mostly from the 90s. However, by 2013 Sugar Ray would start their own nostalgia tour called Under the Sun after some disagreement between themselves and the guys from Everclear. It was the same year that Sugar Ray would be involved in a massive lawsuit when the group's former drummer Stan Frazier, as well as bassist Murphy Cargus, sued frontman Mark McGrath and guitarist Rodney Shepard, claiming that they were forced out of the band and claiming that the group's licensing agreements were renegotiated without them. On top of that, their lawsuit seemed centered around frontman Mark McGrath, who wanted to be paid $10,000 per appearance and wanted to travel first class while his bandmates had to travel coach and earn a smaller paycheck. 
It's not clear what happened with the lawsuit. And in 2019, McGrath admitted to the Daily Mail that he's been dealing with hearing loss, telling the paper, I'm deaf now. I cannot hear anymore. It's been years and years of being on the road and being two feet in front of cymbals and drums. So high frequencies, I can't hear anymore. It's scary because my job is hearing. It was the same year the band also released their latest record, Lil Yachty. The band is still pretty active on the touring circuit to this day. And that concludes today's video, guys. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again on Rock Culture Stories. Take care.